Shannon, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here, and I want to particularly thank Paul and Debbie Johnson seated over there. You'll hear Paul yell out a little bit later, louder and funnier. Uh, but we've uh, known, Paul and I have known each other for four decades, nearly. And this has been such a nice invitation, and we can spend some time reminiscing. But I did confess to him that I was a bit nervous about my assignment today, and he said, Joe, relax. Don't try to be intelligent. Don't try to be humorous. Just be yourself. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Paul, I, I, I hope that advice works. Um, I grew up, in fact, I was born about 75 years ago, next week, in a very small town in, uh, in Indiana. And I grew up, uh, my, both my parents were teachers. Um, they believed passionately in two things, education and travel. And so my brother and I were exposed to that, all of those things, from very early years. And um, since it was a small town, I, I grew up having a, a very keen sense of the place where I, where I lived. I was uh, a relatively small child, and I'm sort of, I still maintain that, uh, uh, that height, by the way. Uh, but I was quite spry, and I had an affinity for um, protective headgear. <laughs> I like protective headgear. And uh, uh, th there, there I am again. And devices that reached a very high speed. So this uh, number 66 probably uh, reached a top speed of 15 miles an hour d down Dead Man's Hill uh, across a, a small creek onto a gravel road. I also, I loved altitude, and I always, I always had a feeling for altitude and was trying to go higher. And uh, I, was, I was a relatively good climber. There, there I am, uh, going for altitude again, and you notice my very fast vehicle with the steering wheel on the sidewalk. Still higher, and this is no longer the small town in Indiana. Uh, this is the Great Pyramid uh, beside the Nile, and I climbed that when I was still in college. One was permitted to climb it in those years. So uh, I'd, I'd, I'd gotten a little higher, and I'd gotten farther away from this small town in Indiana, and it was beginning to get a sense of the dimensions of the world, which uh, uh, we've all fortunate in doing that. There I am on top of a mountain in Washington State. Now, uh, I have already gotten my PhD in physics. Um, about the time I climbed, climbed this mountain, John Glenn flew in space, the first American astronaut, and that was 50 years ago this year. To my amazement, four years later, the NASA selected a handful of people who were PhD scientists, gave us the name of scientist astronaut, and immediately sent us off to a high-performance jet aircraft school. But they envisioned us to be the people that would follow the Apollo flyers, and we would, we would populate laboratories, which they, the very bullish NASA, intended to build after the successful moon landing. So I became an astronaut, and as a consequence, a few years later, this was me. Uh, I have... Uh, I'm now uh, 400 miles high, and I'm traveling at a speed of 18,000 miles an hour. But I've gotten a little ahead of my story, so let me back up. These are the devices that Nation America has used for the last 30 years to travel to space. This, of course, is called the Space Shuttle. This is the Mighty Ship Challenger on the way to the launch pad, and you see the launch pad in the, in the distance uh, uh, prior to her maiden voyage. Uh, this is the spaceship, uh, spaceship Columbia on the launch pad, and I took this photograph before my first flight in 1982. One walks across a gantry right there to climb into the crew cabin, and that gantry is 42 stories high. Uh, it's an open grill work, so as you walk across, if you're afraid of heights, you don't want to look down. Uh, you, you see that gantry, and uh, 
the spaceship Discovery. Discovery has been loaded with propellant. As you, as you see it there, uh, she weighs about 4 million pounds, and she's loaded with cryogenic propellant, liquid ho oxygen and uh, liquid hydrogen. And you just hear the spaceship creak and talk. Uh, it feels very restless as though it, it fully intends to go someplace in a few hours. <laughs> Here it goes. You've all seen photographs and television shows of uh, space shuttle launches, and a number of you, I know uh, the Johnsons have, have seen at, at least one launch, perhaps several more, and I hope others of you have seen them uh, in real life because they literally shake the ground. There, uh, the spaceship Discovery goes outbound. You'll see the, the, the five engines burning. They are producing five and a half million pounds of thrust. And because of that thrust, you go outbound at an increasing linear acceleration. You yourself, who are seated in a chair, not unlike those that you're in right there, except it has a high back. And the chair is affixed to the floor, but the floor, of course, is vertical. And so you're, you're seated position, lying on your back, going outbound, and you weigh three times your normal weight. Now, you don't have to call out that number. Oh. <laughs> Although, if, if there's some youngsters here that weigh 50 pounds, you'd weigh 150 pounds, and it, it's, it's kind of cool. It's really cool. That lasts for eight and a half minutes. Then the engine shuts down. You're in thundering silence and you're traveling 18,000 miles an hour. Now, this is a photograph of Florida. I hope, I hope you can see it clearly. There's Lake Okeechobee. This is the peninsula of Florida. The Cape itself is right here. We've gone once around the Earth, so it's an hour and a half after the launch. With binoculars, we could look down and see the traffic jam still leaving uh, the launch site, your friends and neighbors. <laughs> And we, in the meantime, have been once around the world. <laughs> a hurricane from orbit, the northern lights from above. This is not Cape Kennedy, this is Cape Cod. This is the spaceship, mighty spaceship um, uh, Challenger, and this is flight number seven. Notice the, the signal that the, the, the Canada arm is giving us, the number seven. You're in a world of zero gravity. Um, now, I want to stop. This is zero gravity. Uh, life is, is very hectic and but very much fun. You can put sleeping bags on the ceiling, on the wall, on the floor. Uh, you and your shipmates float in, in every possible direction. You weigh ab nothing at all, nor do the canned pears that are affixed to the spoon. Uh, these are drink containers. Uh, you'll see orange juice on your right, and uh, on the left is a new NASA invention. It's called dehydrated water. All you have to do is add water, and then you have water. <laughs> this is not an egg. This is the orange juice, and I've just given it its freedom. And, and I've... Uh, I uh, put a little puff of air on it so it's gone into an oblong shape a little bit, but it will quiver and shake like the world's weakest jello. This is uh, a liquid you've seen today, perhaps even consumed. This is Coca Cola. But if you think about it, Coke bubbles always go to the top and pop out. But there is no up or down in space, there's no top, no bottom. I've puffed on the Coke. And the liquid part is sloshing back and forth between the bubbles. It's, it's great fun. So, so uh, this gives you a, a sense of the zero gravity. Now, I want to stop here for just a second. We were told that North America was discovered by Christopher Columbus and uh, a couple of his mates, but they had seamen who, or sailors who were um, uh, uneducated people, almost certainly, couldn't read or write. And many of them were very fearful that the crazy captain was going to sail to the edge of the earth and fall off. The reason I mention that is now, uh, these hundreds of years later, I've described to you uh, individuals that deliberately walked down, put themselves in a machine like this. 
expose themselves to linear acceleration for eight and a half minutes. The engine shuts down and they, you, fall off the edge of the earth. That is what orbital flight seriously is. You're falling perpetually as you coast around the earth and around the earth, once around every hour and a half. On my first mission, I deployed two satellites. This is one of them. Um, uh, two years later, two satellites just like that were deployed and wound up not going to geosynchronous orbit as planned, but stuck in, in a low altitude orbit about 400 miles high. Each of these was worth $400 million, but they could not be used because they were in the wrong place. Strangely, on that same mission that stranded the two satellites, the, the manned maneuvering unit was tested successfully. And nine months later, we used the manned maneuvering unit to fly out and salvage the stranded satellites. And I'm going to give you a very brief uh, description of that. Uh, this is, uh, shows several satellites in this picture. This is Earth, satellite of the sun. This is the, uh, the Discovery spaceship, or the arm, satellite of the Earth. Palapa, satellite of the Earth. And Joe Allen, sat satellite of the Earth. And had I known when I was studying physics that I myself one day would be a satellite, I would have been a much better physics student. Uh, th there, I, I approach Palapa. Uh, I've successfully gotten Palapa. I've now, I've, I'm flying back to the spaceship uh, using a variety of clamps uh, and uh, the arm and so on. We uh, successfully put Palapa and then later West Star in the payload bay. And uh, this is a photograph taken from inside the spaceship. The uh, satellites were now owned by Lloyds of London. And so we decided to give them a little free advertising photo. Uh, Dale's holding a, a, a photograph that, that reads for sale. <laughs> There's the photograph. And this is the only photo I've ever taken that I'm also in. There I am for sale. Lloyd's of London was thrilled. NASA was not as amused as I thought they would be. <laughs> All right. Um, here we are, just other pictures around you. Uh, uh, this is a photograph that was, I took that, that was on the cover of Time magazine, and the, the, the caption read, NASA astronaut Dale Gardner, spacewalk, and the photo credit was NASA photographer. <laughs> I canceled my subscription. <laughs> now, just a little bit of, Dave, of uh, monkey Arnold business here. Uh, Dr. Little Allen bit. Is, uh as large in personality but uh, diminutive in stature. Whenever his personality got a little bit too large, we would uh, stuff him away in a locker for a few hours. And uh, then when a task needed to be done, it was my job to go out, go down and get him out. This was a somewhat unpleasant task for me, but, uh, but Joe, Joe seemed to like the freedom at times. And <laughs> the hard part was putting him back in there again later once we got him. <laughs> My sense of place there was I had been stuffed into a locker. <laughs> this is how we start our homeward journey. The spaceship lands on planet Earth, and I love this photo. This is from my first flight. I always wanted it to appear on the front page of every newspaper in America with the headline, Today, a spaceship landed on Earth, and it was built by the collected intellect of America. Just a number of, uh, there's an international space station flying right now. We have two space flyers aboard it. There's six individuals aboard it. But we now, because the orbiters have ended, must travel up and down with the Russians. Uh, which, uh, that's the subject of another TED talk. Uh, <laughs> longer than 18 minutes. Uh, but it's a beautiful sight. Uh, this is the photograph on the New York Post of the last landing of the last orbiter. 
and then they were loaded aboard a 747 and shipped to museums. This in Washington, D.C., the mighty spaceship Discovery, which I flew on my second mission. Uh, Discovery has been delivered to the Udvar Hazy Museum, and these are the space flyers of Discovery, and I'm um, amongst uh, that group of individuals dressed in our flight suits. Thank you very much. Uh, most of us can still fit in <laughs> if you don't breathe. And that brings me to the end. Uh, but to think about a sense of place, and I can assure you that the people aboard the International Space Station right now no longer look through binoculars at their home, nor do they even particularly seek out their continent, but rather they, during their, their uh, leisure hours, and they have a few, listen to their iPods, their favorite music, in some cases, arm in arm, and look out at the, the beautiful blue planet, planet Earth. And you cannot imagine anything more glorious and gorgeous and apparently so fragile looking. You look out at the horizon and you see an onion uh, skin color on the horizon 1,500 miles away, and that is the atmosphere. And you realize that it is so delicate, and if anything happens to it, uh, perhaps caused by us humans, then life, all of life on planet Earth, will cease to exist. So our sense of place, I can assure you, in the minds of every space traveler, is of the beauty and the fragility of planet Earth and how we must preserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.